welcome. My name is Alexandra Burroughs, and I will be doing a presentation on my patent, uh, which is the patent for the Department of Patient Equipment Usage Tracker and a Pre-Verify Equipment Patient Admission Verification. First and foremost, I want to say that I reached out to Medtronic with the submission of my idea, and they thought it was a very good idea. So um, I would like to proceed in uh, getting this idea um, up and running. Uh, however, the obstacle that I ran into is that I do not know how to write the code. So um, we're just going to go through the patent here. Um, First and foremost, the patent starts with, I. oh, actually, I want to let you know I used a 24-hour uh, patent book. So that's what aided me in doing the patent. And I'll show you the book I used, actually, too. step-by-step guide to filing at the U.S. Patent Office. And you see all my bookmarks and tabs in here where I went along the process and learned pretty much how to patent this by myself and has some examples in here, like the napkin ring, for example. All right. So that was our resource, and that's through Nola. Um, Medtronic showed me, uh, I saw on the website, Med Medtronic sent me an email, told me I had intellectual property and that I think we ran in the, the understanding that there was some value with the um, idea that I submitted. It was an innovative idea. Electronic medical records already exist and also inventory in the hospital. What makes my patent so unique is the fact that it tracks pathogens based on the patient's diagnosis to prevent communicable disease transmission by implementing a sterilization process. <coughs> Medtronic has uh, a business relationship with uh, Apple, and it says Better Medicine Through the iPad. Uh, this is a, on their website a while back. I'll just show you a little bit here. And you can see Medtronic Better Medicine Through iPad. And this is my initial submission uh, handwritten for Medtronic Idea Conceptions. Uh, there is another patent out there that uh, addresses hospital-acquired infections. Um, it's kind of weird because I guess we were both working toward the same goal at the same time. Um, but this patent wasn't um, visible or any of these ideas weren't visible. It, they did federally um, funded research and it's US Patent 13 slash 401,284. And they filed, I think, February 21st, 2012. I filed my patent actually August 1st, 2011. And then I also have the actual Medtronic submission where I submitted my idea, preview of your submission. As my name is Alexandra Burroughs, CEO of Lakes Enterprises, and it goes on to tell you about Ever Verify. So, <clears throat> okay, and this is a confidential video. Um, this video is, serves a purpose to explain verbally and orally aloud the, um, uh, the details of the patent. Okay, uh, my application, it says, 
cross-reference to related applications. This application claims to benefit the patent application number 13, comma, 097, comma, 074, filed 2011 by the present inventor, Alexandra D. Burroughs. The following is a tabulation of some prior art that presently appears to be relevant. So I address the patents that were any, in any form related to uh, prior art on hospital card infections or tracking um, any type of sterilization method or tracking hospital card infections or patient safety. Those are the hospital patents that I found. Uh, patent number 7908-153 and then publication number 0306921. And uh, those were issued in 2011 and 2010. Um, I was not federally sponsored for my research in 2011, and the sequence listing or program was not applicable, and the background discussion and prior art. <clears throat> so I'll read. In the year 2009, Lex Enterprises was formed as a sole proprietorship in the state of Texas. As of 2011, it is identified as Lex Enterprise Incorporated, and also holds the trade name of the Healthcare Intelligence Agency. Hospitals are challenged by the amount of hospital acquired infections that currently jeopardize the safety, quality, and assurance of the hospital. Currently, there is a lack of proper sterilization techniques being used within high turnover areas. In order to reduce the amount of hospital acquired infections, proper chemical usage, sterilization knowledge, and hands-on re clinical resources, infections, infectious agents, and pathogen disease transmission prevention techniques are needed to be accessible and innovatively developed. Originally, hospitals have hired and managed an in-house cleaning staff to save lives, remove pathogens and infectious agents from the environment, cure diseases, provide treatment for the ill, and uphold the quality of the hospital environment. This lacks a competitive initiative and overwhelms the staff. Uh, I specifically say overwhelm the staff, I'm specifically referring to EBS, Environmental Services. Um, Competition-wise, if they're the only ones managing the whole hospital by themselves and they don't really have anyone to answer to, um, except, you know, uh, OSHA and government authorities, which have a lot of hospitals on their hands and they're only one agency. So whenever you uh, have an outside agency comes in, you have the element of competition for other agencies, for example, for medical scribes. You've got like a pro scribe America, you've got physicist scribes. They compete to be the best scribes. So there's no competitive initiative for who can sterilize the hospital the best. There's only the internal staff. Uh, my comp competitors are uh, particularly uh, Universal Hospital Services, which I am a former employee for. And um, I definitely found some innovative ways that we can uh, clean up the hospitals better, and that would be my competitive initiative. Previously, hospitals heretofore are known to suffer from a number of disadvantages, which include the sudden incline of hospital admission, meaning there was a mass casualty, uh, a large car accident, um, or just a sudden increase, uh, a crisis or a pandemic, causing equipment turnover rates to suddenly increase. Uh, if you had a plane crash, that would be a lot of hospital uh, staff and equipment being used to accommodate all the patients that are having a sudden influx. Hospital overflow, accompanied by a shortage in staff. Sometimes if there's not enough people working in the hospital uh, because they can't premeditate every single uh, person to be in the hospital, they may only have a short staff on hand. Um, you have a lot of people that commute from rural areas and rural hospitals, so it's easy to over, go into overflow due to a shortage in staff. It's not necessarily their fault, it's just a shortage in staff. Uh, you have demanding patients, you have a lack of hand hygiene practices by all members visiting the hospitals. That specifically targets uh, patients, visitors, so even though the staff is doing everything they can to wash their hands, uh, patients may try to help with the IV pump if it's beeping and get it to stop beeping. 
They may, you know, try to move the bed or make the patient more comfortable. Um, and they may not be sterilizing their hands. So the hand hygiene initiative by WHO is a great idea, but it also needs to expand to the patients and patients' visitors. This problem has been partially solved with federal guidelines, maintained employment certification and credentials, web-based orientation tools, uh, HIPAA training, blood-borne pathogen training, uh, the training that I received with Universal Hospital Service, which I have record of, and updates through internet sources and databases. So you can use government websites like WHO and the CDC, the FDA and the EPA to learn more about um, updates to pathogens that are a present threat or that exist. Even with this extent of intervention, discrepancies in hospital-acquired infections are still rising worldwide. Uh, the CDC reports that there are about um, a million, about one million hospital-acquired infections that occur. It's one of the leading causes of death, and there are a lot of statistics available, which I have record of, that show this is a prevalent issue. Um, one of our former presidents was hospitalized, and he was suspected to have gotten a uh, pneumonia-based hospital-acquired infections. He didn't go into detail, but he came in with bronchitis and ended up with potentially getting pneumonia. So um, it affects the presidents, it, defect, it affects everybody in life, uh, it affects the pediatrics, children, it affects the elderly, uh, those are the most susceptible because their immune systems are either not well developed or have, they're going through other medical comorbidity uh, diseases that are affecting their immune system. So, which make them more susceptible to getting a hospital acquired infection because your immune system is what kills uh, pathogenic bacteria in your body. Um, public health is at the state of infection every day and hospital acquired infection mortality rates are on the incline. Surveillance elements, charts, and lunch and learning sessions. Analysis are current common methods. Many like reinforcement, comprehensible and easily accessible resources. So what I mean by this is, if you have a question about the MSDS, um, or you haven't been trained on how to use an MSDS chart, you may not know how harmful a particular chemical could be to an infant uh, to which you're sterilizing. So I, it was communicated to me that brufrine was harmful for infants, so uh, putting that on equipment could cause them to possibly have respiratory issues, which could be one of the reasons why so many of their lungs fail and um, you use the CPAP pumps and things of that nature. But that's a little bit out of my scope, I'm not a doctor. But, um, you know, harsh chemicals and MSDS charts need to be uh, made available and there needs to be like a hotline or a resource so people can call and say, is this okay for me to use on this type of medical device or is it too harmful? Especially uh, devices that come in, clo come in close contact with the mucous membranes or go through the lungs, or uh, actually penetrate through the body using like an endoscope during a colonoscopy or things like that. So, um, versus a pair of crutches. Uh, crutches can handle a, a more harmful chemical because it only comes in contact with the skin unless there's an allergy. But something that's actually going down the throat, you know, it's being exposed to the pharynx, the larynx, the mucous membrane, um, and those things, it may be a little more harmful to the lungs or uh, to that person's um, respiratory system if the chemicals are too harsh. So those are things that we need to be mindful of when going forward. Um, the next thing is prior art fails to solve the problem and there is a lack of integrated approach to hospital acquired infections. Ownership and less finger pointing will give rise to reduction. The need to reduce morbidity and mortality rates due to hospital-acquired infections is seen by rising numbers and statistics. Elimination of disease transmission is a must. Nevertheless, all the hospital-acquired infection prevention efforts have failed to eliminate the spread and transmission of healthcare-associated infections, or also known as HAIs, heretofore known to suffer from a number of disadvantages. And here I'll state some of the disadvantages. Accordingly, several attempts focus on specific elements when sources as a whole need to be acknowledged. I have found that scanner systems also lack, often like alert mechanisms. Timing, uh, specifically, if you have an infection control violation and you're on the floor doing rounds, 
you will not know about the infection control until you upload your scanner and see the conflict, and then it could be too late. So the alert uh, being readily available on the scanner uh, for an infection control or a same name alert is more effective, which I'll talk about in my patent on the, as I go through it. Timing in between patients is neither being appropriately timed nor advised. Uh, there needs to be an aeration period and a proper sterilization period where the uh, actual chemical comes in contact with the device, medical device servicing the patient. Um, and also as the patient's health improves, you need to go in and clean up uh, any blood or substances or food or dried food from feeding pumps or things like that on the equipment. Um, so just as you change your undergarments or you change your clothes and take showers, Equipment should go through a hygiene process. It should, as a person uses equipment for a certain time and their health improves, um, they should, you know, have their equipment sterilized. And then while that aeration period is taking place and that contact period with the chemical is taking place, they can be provided with a new IV pump. It may seem a little strenuous at first, but if we get into a good flow and have a good uh, inventory of equipment, it would be very easy to switch out IV pumps just as the nurse switches out the line. So that's a great way to do it. Whenever they switch out the line, you can switch out the pump for a clean one. Um, especially if a patient has been on isolation and then is now taken off isolation, I believe this patient should get a new IV pump. And I'll use the IV pump as a primary source because generally most patients get an IV pump. Other pa uh, pumps that are very commonly used are SCDs, PCAs, patient control anesthesia, feeding pumps, and um, you know, just uh, crutches, wheelchairs, beds, and mattresses. Okay. Um, next, scanners are often downloaded onto a computer after completion of a task such as tracking data, inventory, placement, and census. I feel that the system should be integrated for real-time activity. Um, just as if you go to swipe your debit card at Walmart, you can open up your app, the Walmart app, or you can open up the bank account app, and you can see you know, how much was charged on your gift card and what the remaining balance is. You can check your bank account and see Walmart transaction and how much was taken out of your account. That's what I mean by real-time activity. Once you scan an IV pump, if this is a potential communicable disease acting as a vector because there was a, the, person, the patient had MRSA and they've been in the hospital three, four, five days and they're now taken off isolation, you could be get real-time activity that it's time to swap the pump out and give them a clean, fresh, sterile IV pump so that none of those pathogens that could potentially be on that IV pump from them touching it, from them coughing on it, from them bleeding on it, if they had a gunshot wound or anything, uh, is on that pump anymore. So uh, that's what I mean by real-time data and real-time action. So scanners currently, right, right now, are not equipped with user documenting capabilities. I think if you see inconsistencies on the floor or you need to communicate with a doctor about patient diagnosis or what this uh, type of procedure or device is being used for, you should be able, the, pat, uh, the nurse and the doctor should be able to go in and make comments especially if there are any special requests for the patient's uh, health or concerns. An example of that would be neutropenic cautions. I know that neutropenia cautions are sometimes on the patient's wrist, but they're not usually on the door. Um, these uh, things are not um, communicated before entering the room. So the scanner could have an integrated approach to letting you know if someone has a compromised immune system prior to entering the actual um, room on a real-time data. Sterilizations, current methods are not specific to the actual pathogens contaminating the equipment. So what I mean by that is, um, <clears throat> When you get a piece of, when you get an IV pump, or you get a, uh, you know, a pair of bloody scissors or something like that, surgical equipment, you don't really know what pathogens are associated with this device, by based on the blood or the substance on the device. 
because you don't know the patient personally, you don't have access to their medical record, because you may just be a part of the cleaning staff. Um, it's a common practice that all equipment is treated as if it is um, HIV. So, but HIV, things that kill the germs or the disease HIV may not be the same thing that kills hepatitis A, B, and C, influenza A and B. So, knowing specifically which pathogen is associated with that device, you don't have to know who the patient is, but know, knowing what pathogens is uh, associated with that device, and then getting a sterilization method to include the chemical agent that you need to use to sterilize the device, the contact time, the aeration period, uh, and the sterilization method, maybe brushing, crevices, uh, creases, cracks, ensuring hair removal from tight spaces, depending on the type of device it is, um, <clears throat> would be modern technology, would be our next advancement. So currently we are not able to do that, and that's what my path and pat, well, I'm sorry, not pathogen, that's what my patent would like to do. So it would like to be more specific to the actual pathogens present. Uh, for example, Clorox may not kill everything, Lysol may not kill everything. Um, certain concentrations are active, uh, activate the killing of certain pathogens at different levels. So you have to make sure you have the right concentration, you have the right chemical agent, you the right sterilization practices and the best methods, you know, making sure that if you're using a brush or your tools are all conducive to that particular equipment, whether it has crevices, cracks, creases, movable parts, freely movable parts, detachable parts, all those things. I mean, this is a very meticulous job and it needs a special team of people who can go in and do this practically for a living. If you think about someone who builds a computer, all the <clears throat> delicacies and all the small chips, all the resistors and capacitors and fans and small parts that go into building a computer or an Apple iPhone. Breaking those down using almost, you know, microscopes and using uh, tweezers and just picking up little small pieces and parts and gluing them down and things like that. That's the level of meticulous, meticulousness that we need in sterilizing medical devices. Okay, next, <clears throat> we're on letter G. Sterile processing chemicals are often lacking shelf life determination, monitor, concentration specifics, and spore inactivation abilities. Uh, one thing we have to worry about is spores, which makes them highly resistant. Another is making sure you have the appropriate measurement tools to get the right concentration available, preferably a way to test that using litmus paper strips or pH strips um, or other ways to test once you actually put your water in the sink, you add your chemical, a way to test that with a strip to make sure that it's the right concentration. Um, <clears throat> a sterile processing, sterile processing chemicals are often lacking shelf life. If you have something on the shelf, um, you just as if you're in a restaurant, you put the expiration date or you're in the grocery store, there's an expiration date. There needs to be an expiration date from when a chemical was mixed together and set out for use, okay? Based on what chemical it is, so. If you're mixing two things together to make um, your solution, your chemical solution, well, it has a certain time before it becomes ineffective or less effective. So that's what I mean by shelf life. Um, <clears throat> generalized assessments are made when treating infectious equipment and material, which is adverse to the patient's treatment in correlation with antibiotics. Okay, what I mean by this is, um, the HIV on everything, you know, but it, it's unfortunate that there, just because a chemical kills HIV doesn't mean it kills MRSA, influenza, all the hepatitis and things like that. So that's what I mean by generalized. And um, if the patient is receiving antibiotics, but they're getting a hospital acquired infection at the same time, all you're looking at is their white blood cell counts or a potential infection or uh, symptoms, um, the five symptoms of disease, or elevated fever, or things like that. However, what's going on is you're just giving them antibiotics and as a generalized treatment for infection, but 
the chemicals or the vectors of transmission are infecting them and it's making the antibiotics look like they're ineffective. But the antibiotics are effective, it's just that they're being hit with new pathogens and new bacteria as the same time they're getting the antibiotics um, and then get, experiencing those symptoms. Okay? I. Previously, a diagnosis for medical devices does not exist. Furthermore, prior art is wrong and has failed to solve the problem. I implemented an EDX, which is called an equipment diagnosis. What it does is very simple. It takes the patient's diagnosis into the computer system and for verify. Okay? It acknowledges what pathogens are associated with that infection. Then it recommends the sterilization chemical that treats that infection and the best method for treating the type of device that it is. So, very simple, it's pretty much a four-step process. Patient diagnosis, step one. Step two, pathogens present. Step three, chemical agent recommended to treat that pathogen and kill it pathogen so that it becomes sterile. And number four is the way to clean the device. <clears throat> and I believe that a system using those four basic steps will be equivocal to an equipment diagnosis and reduce hospital acquired infections. I think that hospitals do a great job at saving lives and applying patient care. However, in life, we always must strive to get better and improve. Okay? So, um, when the video resumes, we'll be on part two, and we'll start at um, the several attempts have been made to reduce the amount of hospital-acquired infections, starting with A.